<clears throat> Our next uh, talk will be presented by Dr. Charles Kay, who is an adjunct associate professor here at Utah State in the Political Science Department. The title of his talk is The Impacts of Native Ungulates and Livestock on uh, Western Aspen Communities. Gosh. Charles is, uh, uh, like I said, an uh, adjunct in the political science department and a senior research scientist with the Institute of Political Economy uh, here at Utah State. He re received his PhD in wildlife ecology from Utah State and his master's in environmental studies from the University of Montana and BS in wildlife biology from the University of Montana. And he's done research all over the country and it, it would take a half hour to go through what Charles has been up to. Um, so I'll turn it over to Charles right now. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dale and the other people for inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. And for those of you that don't know me or wonder what the person in the political science department is doing up here talking about Aspen uh, today, I'm a wildlife ecologist, okay? Uh, but I'm not politically correct for wildlife ecologists, so they give me political asylum over there. Okay. Uh, but I don't teach any courses and all I do is ecological research because the legislature likes what I do so much they made a position for me over the objection of one of the former presidents, and I emphasize former presidents, of the university. Uh, and I'll get to the politically incorrect part of this talk towards the end, as you'll, you'll see. And I know, you know, I have 500,000 slides in my own personal collection. I like to use my own slide projectors and stuff because I know how to work those. But, uh, okay, so what's happening, happening here? Uh, here you've got an aspen, and there's no regeneration on it, no, no young saplings coming up here, it's saplings coming up. Here you've got shrubs, these are snow bearing. Uh, it's mainly tall forbs, there's not much grass, no shrubs here, and there's grass over here. So what, what's going on here? And this is, this is just a low fence, this is not an exposure. Uh, elk, and this is not, uh, elk and deer use both sides of this fence on this stuff. Uh, so is this apical dominance? I mean, this part of the clone has apical dominance, this part doesn't. Uh, is this due to fire? Uh, this side of the fence burned, and this side of the fence didn't. Is this, is, is this due to drought? I mean, it rained on this side of the fence, didn't it rain here? <laughs> you know, or maybe it's due to global warming. I mean, this side of the fence warmed up and this side of the fence didn't. I messed up. Well, I hate to bring these up and it's not really funny because I've been at a lot of these dirt kicking meetings that they don't know people were talking about and they, somebody's always got another excuse. I mean, actually you can go back and figure out what the problem is if you read Baker's 1919 to 1925 papers, okay? Uh, it hasn't really changed, it's just people don't want to admit the obvious, okay? So what, what's actually going on, on here is it's difference in herbivory, okay? This side is a horse pasture. Horses take out the grass, uh, they don't touch the shrubs much, shrubs, snow bear increases, and they don't touch the aspen, assuming they're lightly stalked. This side here is domestic sheep. The sheep take out the tall forbs on it, they take out the shrubs, they take out the aspen suckers, stop the stand from regenerating, and you're left with these beautiful grasslands, and this is up on Cedar Mountain. Uh, this is probably not natural. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, I've measured, uh, personally measured more aspen disclosures than uh, any other ecologist in the West that I uh, know, know about. And in every case, uh, aspen successfully regenerated without any disturbance when herbivory was con controlled. Uh, this is an exclosure here. It's an eight-foot fence right here. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park. There's no livestock in here. This is just elk. Uh, this is an aspen exclosure in the Yellowstone ecosystem. This is not actually in the uh, a park right here. This is an exclosure. It's on the, actually on the Gallatin. Long exclosure goes this way, comes this way, and goes this way. No livestock in this area. This is just elk. That's what the aspen stands look like, except inside where they've been protected for a number of years. Uh, this is a, a place in southern Utah. This is actually the famous clone. This is called Pando. You're looking at part of the largest living organism on Earth. Uh, it hasn't been regenerating, so they did some clear-cut logging trying to regenerate it. Uh, they clear-cut a part, and uh, it was all eaten to the ground, so they clear-cut a larger part, and they, and they built an eight-foot fence. So this is the eight-foot fence right here. Uh, they, they, this part of the clone is actually dead. Uh, Dale and I and uh, Bob Campbell, we had some research plots. They're mostly they're, uh, Dales, but I helped them measure it the, the last time. This is mainly deer. Okay. Uh, there's not much livestock in this in this uh, area. Uh, this is a 1957 photo of the park pasture, park pasture uh, aspen exposure. This is on the south, uh, excuse me, the east, the east side of uh, Boulder Mountain. This is part of my repeat photo research. I've personally made well over 2,000 repeat photographs uh, throughout the western United States, and probably a thousand of those almost show 
uh, Aspen. So this is the way it looked in 1950, 57 and 57. Uh, there weren't any elk in the country. It had high deer numbers at that time, but this is just a, a five-strand uh, fence. There's actually a sheep proof fence, but they did have sheep on the allotment back in, back in 57. Watch this area right here. Once the livestock were excluded, in fact, the Aspen clone has uh, spread out. Now, the spread has since been stopped uh, by, by elk, but that's another uh, point with this exclosure. Uh, even where conifers are present, Aspen has successfully regenerated inside exclosures. Okay? Uh, this is an exclosure, this is a Hancock exclosure, about 10,000 feet it's on the north end of the Fish Lake, uh, Fish Lake uh, excuse me, the south end of Fish Lake Mound. This is what's called a three part exclosure. Uh, one part is protected with an eight foot fence, so you keep the, uh, the deer and elk out, uh, and you keep the livestock out. And the other part of the, one of the, the second part then is just this low fence. This is on a sheep allotment, so you have a very low uh, fence right here that keep the sheep out. And of course, the third part then is where both the livestock and its adjacent unfenced part of the clone, where both the livestock and the wildlife have aspects to it, uh, access. And by measuring uh, aspen stem dynamics in the three parts of the exposure, you can sort out whether it's climate change or whether it's you know, herbivory with its wildlife or, or its uh, livestock. And so one of the things I've done when they started this aspen ecology project in Southern Utah, my part of it was two things. One, to do the repeat photos and then measure all the long-term existing aspen exposures. So this is inside the exposure, despite the fact that you've got over 40% canopy cover of spruce to 10,000 feet on it, you've got all this aspen re regeneration, all the different stems, and they all date back out to when they uh, built the ex exposure. And Dale and I have published a paper on all these Utah exposures in the Journal of Range Management. Okay, so this is, uh, and this, this is inside the low fence part of it, so there's no sheep in here, but this is just deer. This is primarily was a deer problem that started here, and then the last, in the last 10 or 20 years, the elk numbers have uh, come up. So there's no uh, domestic livestock in here, but even the deer themselves were able then to uh, keep the stand from successfully regenerating. And of course, where you had both the wildlife and the livestock on it, uh, the Aspen stand had no chance of regenerating uh, what's, whatsoever. The okay, aspen uh, ungulates also have a dramatic impact. It's not only when you're talking about biodiversity and burden animal communities and forest protection, wherever you want to talk about it, it's just not the aspen stems that are going on, even though that's the most visible part, as the previous speakers alluded to. There's also massive changes going on in understory species composition. Okay, and this is many of the plants that drive the insects, that drive the birds, that drive the small mammals, that drive everything uh, 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 else. This is, again, uh, this is a three-part exposure. Uh, it's a, a woodchuck exposure. This is on the northeast end of Mount uh, Dutton on the uh, Fish Lake, Fish Lake or Dixie, I can't remember, National uh, Forest. So this is inside the eight-foot fence part where both wildlife and uh, domestic livestock have, have been excluded. And what you have when these aspen stands, uh, you get shrubs and you get tall forbs, especially palatable forbs uh, like Indian paint, paintbrush. Then you just go across the fence. So this is in the same clones. So we're not talking clonal difference, you know, climate difference, fire, or anything else. We're in the same clone. All we're talking about is herbivory differences. So now this is this is the low fence on it. This is a, on a cattle allotment. So this low fence here in the background keeps keeps the cattle out. And mainly, again, this was mostly a deer, uh, historically a deer, because of the high deer numbers in the 50s and 60s that you had on these uh, ranges. So the deer themselves eliminated the shrubs and the tall forbs. And what you're left with is these beautiful native grasslands. Okay. And then in the third part, where you put livestock on top, if the livestock tend, especially the cattle, tend to take out the native grasses, and you're left with Timothy or Kentucky bluegrass, okay, which are non-native species. <clears throat> this is a graph from my dissertation research outside of Yellowstone Park, where I did a 20% random sample of all the aspen clones in the Eagle and Phelps Creek drainages, which are immediately north of the, of the park uh, boundary. And for a little history, uh, up to 1968, the Park Service thought they had too many elk in the park, and the elk were destroying the range and destroying the aspen communities, so they actually controlled elk in the park, and they shot elk in the, in the, uh, in the uh, park. And as they shot elk in the park and they took the count down to 3,176 elk in the park, very few elk came out and wintered outside on this, on this range outside uh, the park. So this solid line here is the number of elk wintering outside the park. And then these, the, the bars here are the, are the percentage of the aspen stands, a 20% random sample in the entire drainages, okay, the percentage of the aspen stands that had a regeneration event within five year intervals. And there's no livestock on this allotment or this place. They've taken it out as dedicated uh, elk and mule deer winter range, primarily elk. There haven't been any fires, there haven't been anything else to stimulate the uh, aspen regeneration. But as you can see, as the elk numbers drop, almost eight, over 80% of the clones had a regeneration event. We have about five years after the thing. And when I'm talking about regeneration, I'm not talking about suckers, I'm talking about things that make it higher than two meters. Okay. <clears throat> but what about fire? 
Uh, won't Bernie Aspen stand successfully regenerate despite herbivorous? I mean, certainly you can use fire. I mean, the aspen stands, you, know, you top kill the trees, and you have this massive sprouting of, uh, of aspen. Uh, this is one of 865 uh, photo points that I have uh, established in Yellowstone after the 1988 fire. So this is uh, in September, uh, October 88, after this burned on the, on the northern range. And within one year, you can see you had this massive sprouting, especially around the edge of the clone, because there was so much conifer fuel bills up here. The, the soil temperature got too hot that actually killed out the, the uh, rooks that are close to the surface that give you most of the sprouting, but the clone was still alive and you had all these suckers one year later. But those suckers were repeatedly into the ground by elk, and today uh, the clone is extinct. So these clones that are thought to be thousands of years old, within 100 years of park management, they're gone. And this has happened virtually on all, all 865 uh, sites. Now livestock can have a similar effect. Uh, if you know my publication history, most of what I've done has been working on wildlife issues because I'm a wildlife biologist. But for three summers, I, uh, under contract to BLM in Nevada, I measured their aspen stands there. And the places they sent me, there were no elk and there's virtually no deer left in, the, in Nevada. So in Nevada, it's mainly a, a livestock uh, a problem. So this is a stand that burned in one of the wildfires they had a, a number of years ago. And for whatever reasons, we don't need to get into the politics of this, but the BLM did not close the allotment after it burned. Okay, so, so this is what the aspen looks like after the cattle have been into it. And that, that, the cattle were there, I had to run them out, out of the stand. And this is one of the, I used two by 30 meter belt uh, transects as Dable and Walt Mugler established when they were measuring that stand. And this is the allotment fence right, right here. So this is what it looks like where it burned it and then they had cattle on top of it. And this is, this is right across the fence. So these two pictures are less than 100 yards away. Okay, so this allotment, the BLM closed. And they try to close them for three years after you have these wildfires. So uh, not only can you get you know, for, for general range restoration, and then I also gave them some guidelines, and I published, uh, wrote a whole thing on aspen management guidelines for the BLM uh, in, the, in the valley. Now, beaver are important in creating and maintaining riparian areas. I've written several papers on this, uh, but not where ungulate herbivory is excessive. Okay. Uh, this is one of the uh, this is a 1922 photo. This is a beaver are working in Aspen stand in Yellowstone National Park. This is a 22 photo. There's a boulder here and a boulder here. Watch those boulders. That's the way it looks today. Now, this is another 1922 photo uh, from Yellowstone Park. This is actually shows the beaver dam is right here down in the back, background here. And you can see these beaver trails are going to be cutting this Aspen clone out here. Watch the boulder right there. That's the same place. Uh, as Aspen, uh, when you had basically when they cut down the old trees, whether then all the suckers are within reach of the browsing animals. And repeated browsing basically kills out the clone. So as, as Aspen has declined, and the same things happened to willows in Yellowstone, beaver have declined, and beaver have been ecologically extinct in the northern range for more than 60 years now. And the same thing, beaver plus livestock can also uh, lead to the elimination of both aspen and in the long run beaver and all the biodiversity and things that are associated with this uh, massive uh, transition or, or trans transformation of the vegetation uh, communities. This is a site in western Wyoming. You can see the beaver moved in here, built this dam, trapped the silt like we'd like them to do and stuff, cut all the aspen here, but you don't see any new aspen saplings or stuff coming out. It all suckered up, I'm sure, uh, but then this is the place where they had a, a too many cattle problem to start with, where the cattle management wasn't done right, timing or, or season of use, and they basically killed out this aspen clone. This has happened up huge areas in this particular drainage. This is another example here of beaver uh, plus cattle in, this is a case is Utah, excuse me, this is Nevada, this is one of my land cruisers here. This is an old beaver dam here. This all used to be aspen. Okay, this all used to be aspen. Beaver moved in and cut it. I'm sure the suckers came up on it. Uh, the cattle ate it to the uh, uh, ground, killing out that part of the clones or, or stands. Since then, they've had a fire move through here. Also, you notice they had some regeneration of what happened in, in, in Nevada, where they had this regeneration event before the fires, actually, is uh, the, the committee went bankrupt. Turns out bankruptcy is really good for Aspen in Nevada. <laughs> and, the, and the range was destocked for five or six years. So, so this was another mountain range where you had uh, the allotment fence went right down the center. And one side, there hadn't been a, tree, a new Aspen tree grown more than two meters tall in 120 years. And this side, all the clones went off. But then they all burnt. But this, but this was the allotment that, that BLM closed. <clears throat> so how did Aspen regenerate in the past? Now we're coming to the politically, really politically big part of this. For it is common knowledge that the West teemed with wildlife before European settlement and despoilation of this idyllic garden of Eden. 
that certain ecologists and wildlife biologists, I'd, I'd say damn near all of them, would have you be the lead. Uh, the answer is simple. Historically, there was actually very little wildlife most places in the West. Okay. It's basically a figment of wildlife biologists and ecologists' imagination. <laughs> they certainly have no data to support it. I'm going to mainly, there's all sorts of data sets, and I work on this, and it's in my public hand. So I'm mainly going to talk about the aspen here, because aspen, one of the reasons I study aspen is start starting in Yellowstone, and I've been invited to Parks Canada and studied it up there, and they picked it as a critical indicator of long term ecosystem states and processes. Okay. It's very critical as far as how the old ecosystem function, how things function in the past, how things were structured in the, in the, in the past. Aspen is a key indicator of this on intermountain ranges. As most of you know, elk like to eat the bark of, of aspen for whatever reason. It's not known yet why they uh, do this. <clears throat> Being cervids, they only have uh, teeth in the front part of their lower jaw. So they dig their teeth into the bark and just move their heads upwards and strip off these, this, this bark and, and eat it. Okay, aspen's response to this or any injuries to pr is produced this black scar tissue. Uh, this was actually an old a bison paddock in Banff National Park that they took the fence down to develop wildlife quarters so the wolves could come in and eat these things. On it. They all quickly moved in, and this is what they did to that young regeneration in the in the aspen. So you, see this, you can see this black high line on the aspen trunks. <clears throat> now, according to the Park Service, this is natural white bark aspen. The lower two meters is unnatural. Okay, this is the way the whole West looked prior to the Europeans getting. It. This is their. This is the natural regulation when they switch views in Yellowstone, when they stop killing elk, um, when they think everything's natural. Natural regulation isn't. Letting nature take its course. It's a particular view of how nature operates, and this is a food limited model, and predation has no effect on any of the population whatsoever, according to the park service. So, this is the way the aspen is supposed to look. Well, if that's true, then you go to historical archives and you find the earliest photographs that you can find. And I hate to say I've searched every archive in the country that I know about, but I think I have. And my friends are the same thing in Canada. They just did his PhD on aspen ecology from Jasper in the north to water in the south, 12 different granules. So, if you find old photographs, they ought to be black to lower two meters. Okay, this is a photo of aspen. This is actually beaver felled aspen being, being felled in 1899 in Yellowstone Park. Notice they're white all the way to the bottom. These are branch scars. These are normal for aspen. Okay. So that's an 1899 photo of aspen. This is an 1893 uh, photo. This is Company D of the Minnesota National Guard uh, during the lunch break on this type of stuff. Note, 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 note the aspen here. It's white all the way to the uh, bottom. This is an 1870 photo of aspen in the winters here in uh, Utah. Again, it's white all the way to the bottom. This is a 1900 photo, early 1900 photo, of aspen in the Canadian Rockies. This is actually at Kootenai Plains on that stuff. Note aspen's white all the way to the bottom. And this is an 1872 photo uh, that Hillers took in southern Utah. He called it Bee Lake. It's not called that today. Uh, notice aspen are white all the way to the bottom. This is just a spruce fir forest now, but that's another story. And this is an 1873 photo in, in Colorado. This is one of these people. One of these people is uh, William Henry Jackson, and one of these people is uh, Hayden and sitting in the, in, the, in the front row. So this is 1873 in Colorado. Uh, again, I've checked all the earliest photographs that I know about for Western North America, and a lot of these photographs are BC or BL or BS, before cattle, before livestock, or before sheep. And there's actually only four or five photos that I know about in the whole North America that are before the livestock got here. And between myself and Cliff White and Canada, we've redone most all those photographs, the ones that we can find. Okay, now similarly, elk and deer uh, like to highline what a young aspen. What happened here? And this is a photo. Uh, this is actually in the paper on aspen enclosures that Dale and I, I published. This is a photograph of aspen on the Dixie National Forest. You got the old mature uh, trees here. And then what happened is the deer population crashed in the 70s. Okay, all the aspen root sucker, and you had this young class of new aspen sapling come up. The deer population came up by 85 and high lined the vegetation. Okay, high lined the aspen. Aspen's very palatable, but livestock and, and wildlife like to eat the aspen. So again, if you always had always had large numbers of deer and elk on these intermountain ranges, and you go to these old photographs again on it, uh, they all ought to be high lined. Because these old photographs, again, are not just snapshots in time to tell you a great deal about it long-term ecosystem states and, and process, both fire ecology and, and particularly ungulate herbivory and what factors actually limited ungulate populations and structured entire uh, plant communities. Uh, so this is an 1873 photo of Aspen in the Black Hills. Uh, excuse me, 1874 photo of Aspen in the Black Hills. On it. Uh, regenerating Aspen stand after partially burnt. Those got branches all the way to the uh, uh, bottom. This is an 1872 photo, again, uh, before a livestock photo on, on Boulder Mountain taken by Hillers. Branches all the way to the bottom. 
This is an 1893 photo of Aspen in Yellowstone National Park. Notice the young regenerated aspen after a fire probably 20 or 30 years earlier. They have branches all the way to the bottom. There's no signs of ungulate herbivory at all. And this is an early photo from the Canadian Rockies. Uh, not only is aspen white all the way to the bottom, it's got branches all the way to the bottom. No signs of ungulate herbivory at all. Now, as part of my research on long-term ecosystem states and processes, I've systematically evaluated all wildlife observations uh, left by early explorers. I hate to say I have them all, but I think I have all the first-person historical journals of exploration in Western uh, North, North, North America. This is part of my Yellowstone dissertation research. This is the outline of the park here. And the spaghetti-like thing is the uh, routes of the explorers. At the present time, there's over 100,000 elk in the system, over 5,000 bison in the park, and 600 wolves, and this is all thought by various people to be natural. Yet between, uh, but between 1835 and 1876, there were 26 different expeditions. They spent 765 days in the Yellowstone ecosystem on foot or horseback, yet they reported seeing elk only once every 18 days. Bison were seen only three times, none of which were in the present confines of the park, and no one saw or killed a single wolf. Okay. Uh, at the request of Parks Canada, I uh, conducted similar analysis of early wildlife observation in the Canadian Rockies. And although elk dominate that system to uh, day, at least until the wolves re re recolonize the area, early explorers accounted elk only once every 81 days, or excuse me, only once every, every, th every 31 days. Okay, what this is for the, for the map here is Montana, Idaho, Washington, Canada above it, Alberta on this side, BC here, you have Banff Park here, Jasper Park, and then Yoho and Kootenai. And these lighter lines are the routes taken by the early explorers in the Canadian Rockies. Hence, so they saw elk once every 31 days. But didn't Lewis and Clark report the West team with wildlife? Turns out, not at all. Okay? People have been totally misrepresenting and misreading the journals. In fact, the data support the exact opposite conclusion. Okay, what I've done is by using three different methods, I've quantified all the wildlife observations in Lewis and Clark journals. This, this graph here represents 40,000 data points. Okay? And then I developed it, and then I, to, for simplification, I do divided their trip into 55 trip segments, okay? So what you have here is the mean abundance, daily abundance of all wildlife species, these are all ungulate species, and grizzly bears and wolves, and the mean daily abundance of native people here. I can plot the mean daily abundance of wildlife and mean daily abundance of people all the way for eight, all 863 days of Lewis and Clark's expedition, okay? On it. And what you see, uh, first of all, the, the zero axes are offset because there's so many points that fall on the zero, zero line. This is called the smoothing spline with cross uh, validation. Uh, you can't, the, the, the statistician here in Natural Resources told me you couldn't uh, run a regression on this because the points were auto-correlated. Auto so this, has no, this line has no statistical value. It just means half the points are above it, half the points are below it. But what's important here, what does two mean for mean daily amounts of native people? This means this is just a new sign. They lose from court partner, new sign. Time to get the new sign to native, everything is gone. The only thing that's left is white-tailed deer. Turns out, and this is another thing that wildlife ecologists haven't pointed out or known or whatever reason, Lewis and Clark killed more white-tailed deer than all other ungulates put together. If it wasn't for white-tailed deer, Lewis and Clark might even starve. But that's a whole other issue. So there wasn't any wildlife. In fact, if it had not been for a buffer zone between tribes at war, Lewis and Clark would have found very little wildlife anywhere in the West. C.M. Russell uh, titled this painting, When the Sioux and Blackfeet Meet. Uh, thus, the excessive herbivory seen on most Western Aspen communities today is totally outside the range of historical variability. Instead, Native Americans were the keystone predator that kept ungulate populations at very low levels, including local extinctions. Uh, this is why Aspen has been able to survive for thousands of years or more on intermountain ranges by vegetative reproduction. But what about wolves? and other predators. Can't they keep ungulate numbers low without invoking native hunting? And this has actually been tested in uh, Canada now, uh, because just like we did in our park service, the Canadians wiped out wolves in there too, in the Canadian Rockies. The last time was in the late 60s under a rabies scare, okay, where they poisoned them out. Uh, and it turns out the Canadians, especially Parks Canada, but most Canadians, they have an entirely different view of wolves and, and, and predation than our park service and our fish and wildlife service who are promoting wolf recovery here in the West. Uh, this is a place called Willow Creek. It's on the Snake Indian River. It's a very remote part of the park. Uh, you have to hike in this a, 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 a long ways. And it turns out wolves naturally recolonize this area because they never worry about the whole North Country in Canada. There's no peoples there, so why worry about uh, rabies up there? So they didn't wipe the wolves out. So the wolves naturally recolonize this part of the Canadian Rockies first. And they've been in there since the 1970s. So it's over 34 uh, years uh, now. 
And, and what's happened, and this is actually was first reported to us, I want to give this man credit, because he doesn't have a PhD and he gets dumped on by all the people who have PhDs. And he knows more about wolf ecology than most people who have PhDs in wolf ecologies. Man's name is Dick Decker. He ran the Canadian Wolf Defenders for 15 years. It turns out Dick Decker is the only rational wolf lover I've ever met in my life. Okay, Dick Decker knows exactly what wolves do, fully acknowledges what wolves do, on it, and makes no bones about what they do. And what he said is he spent 30 years sitting on these hillsides watching wolves and elk. And this, is a, this is a, was a denning site on it. And what he said, when the wolves came in, they dropped the elk population 80 to 90%, and lo and behold, all the asking was generated. So Parks Canada, and we thought, ah, that's the solution. You don't have to invoke natives or, or anything else. So this is the man here, Cliff, Cliff White, who just did his, that PhD that I talked about. And so you, we, we walked in there, and the first time we walked in there, uh, I hate to say we were stupid, but we were stupid on it. We just walked all the trails. Well, it turns out the wolves walk all the trails too. Okay? And so what Cliff did is he uh, counted wolf scats, he counted elk droppings, both on the trails and at various distances from the trails. And what he found out is the only place you get this regeneration response in aspen. This wasn't burned, this wasn't treated, it just all came up because the elk weren't chewing on it. Elk, moose, and the deer too, they took them all down on that stuff on it, uh, was because these were high wolf use areas. And so this is what the aspen looks like near the trails, but that's pretty much what the aspen looks like in the rest of the parks. Okay. Even though the elk numbers are dropped 80 to 90 percent, it's not enough to allow the aspen to, re, to, re, to regenerate. In conclusion, then, <laughs> ungulate herbivory must be controlled if, uh, if aspen is to maintain its historic presence on the uh, on the landscape. Uh, I haven't seen these new areas that uh, Wayne Shepherd and the other person's talking about, uh, but in my experience, I've never seen a clone die out without some suckers coming out. Okay, now, those ones on Cedar Mountain they talked about, I was on that field trip, it took me about 15 minutes to figure out what was going on, which was too many sheep, okay, there, historically. But it's private property, and Jim Bounds and others, they have to work with the private landowners, so they don't like to sort of hit them over the head with a two by four, they sort of want to lead them down the path. To the, to the, so, and some of the landlords have uh, realized that themselves. Matter of fact, I was repeating some photos on Cedar Mountain, some old uh, part of my repeat photo project on the Dixie National Forest, and I ran into one man as I was going through a gate, and your Aspen Symposium two years ago worked in Cedar City. He took the message to heart. Some, I wasn't there, I think I was over in Africa at the, at, at the time doing the favorite thing I do, which is hanging things on the wall. And that uh, he was building his own, he was fencing his Aspen clones. <coughs> And he was already seeing the suckers that were coming up. They were now three or four feet high because he was keeping his sheep off them. And he realized that that was a thing. So we always wonder when we do this research, we talk to these conferences, whether we're really doing any, any good or not. Well, there's at least one example there on Cedar Mountain where one land, I mean, he only had like 1,200 acres there, but he was fencing his aspen clubs to, 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 uh, keep, to keep the sheep, sheep out. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Surely I, I upset somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you kind of like to those uh, scar marks in the lower portions of the atom, but there was a very low density of uh, ungulates in those areas. Well, low density of elk. The only deer don't scar. The only two things that scar here in North America are, are moose and uh, elk. But is that a factor, maybe how much they're hanging in a given area, which could be your and how much pressure there is? Uh, pressures on them, rather than the fact that whether they're getting higher or lower? Not really. That's the problem. Well, that, that's been the thing now with Bob Besta and, and, and Ripple with Yellowstone Park. They're claiming that it's just this behavioral response. Well, we went up there with Bob, okay? And he's right. There's a few places the wolves, where the wolves have gotten taller. Okay? There's no places the aspen's gotten taller. Okay? Um, so there's no places any saplings. And the other thing is I asked Bob, well, you know, you move the elk from A to B. Well, B used to have tall wolves. How are you going to get the tall wolves back at B? And of course, he's got no answer. None. Because it's not just a behavioral response, it's a numerical response. You have to take the elk down to virtually zero. Because that's what they were. And it turns out moose is even a better story. Historically, they were virtually, I mean, Lewis and Clark, they were in all this riparian habitat. You know how many times they saw moose? One time. And it was in the absolute center of a buffer zone between the Blackfeet and the Flathead Salish Kootenai. I was on the Big Blackfoot River near Ovanda. Okay. So one time they saw moose. Historically, there were hardly any moose in the West. Most of Alaska, there wasn't even any moose. In the parts of Alaska where there were no moose, it was where they had salmon that came up because the native people have alternative resources. Because the reason the native people do this, I mean, there's several reasons. One, it turns out 
Conservation is very seldom favored by evolution by natural selection. So these people weren't stupid. They were evolutionarily getting astute. Because the way they tried to do conservation, their genes would be very quickly removed from the population. It's also it's because humans are a different kind of predator. In predator prey theory, that would be called they're, they're what's called the starvation tolerant predator. And the point being, the more stable starvation tolerant the predator, the greater impact it can have on its preferred prey. It turns out humans are the most starvation predator in the world because we can prey switch down the trophic level. So places like the Columbia Basin, where you have these millions of salmon that come up, I mean, you ever think about why you didn't have large herds of buffalo in the Columbia Basin? Why Lewis and Clark saw nothing in the Columbia Basin except a handful of white-tailed deer, and everybody else too, on that. It's all Native American predation pressure. And then the other thing that I do, and I have in this paper's coming out too, is really politically incorrect. All this burning stuff, turns out lightning fires are totally unnatural. And that's the title of the paper. I compared known lightning emission rates that I have the data for every national forest in the entire, in the, in the entire country, and that you can calculate various uh, aboriginal ignition rates based on uh, inadvertent fires. Turns out there's no evidence that any native person any place in the history of the world ever put out a campfire. Okay? We can do this both archaeologically and from ethnographic records. That's no joke. It's no joke. Okay? Uh, you, can, you can pull this out archaeologically. So you do the, you run, you run the numbers and it, it's based on how many people you assume were here in, in the uh, um, Americas. And that turns out to be a very politically incorrect subject too. Okay? Um, it's how, how many people there were. But using the lowest standard accepted estimate of only 2 million people north of uh, Mexico, uh, Aboriginal ignition rates were anywhere from 270 to 35,000 times higher than known lightning ignition rates. The native people created all these vegetation communities we think are natural. Okay. So how's that for politically correct? <laughs> well, I mean, when I started out, when I started out, Dale knows this, I, when I started here, I started my PhD under Fred, Fred Wagner, who used to be the associate dean in the College of Natural Resources. When I came here, I had three apple boxes full of files. I have 55 file cabinets. Okay, I, I never set out to study native people. It all started because of what Yellowstone said, and that's just where the data led me. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>